Hi everyone, my name is Laura Canical. I work for the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment, also known as DPI, it used to be OEH, etc, etc. <laughs> Um, I work in the Saving Our Species program, which is the New South Wales government's threatened species conservation program. And today I'm going to talk about mostly uh, about a particular species, the bread bow gentian, and its response to the bushfires that occurred last year. I'll also talk a little bit about some other gentian species and some of the challenges that we face with those, and also some of the adaptations um, and I wouldn't say failings, challenges that the plants and species themselves have in regards to um, resilience in the face of climate change and other impacts. I will talk a little bit about me, bear with me about that, it's more sort of a background thing. Um, talk a bit about Saving Our Species program, that'll just be one slide. Uh, an introduction to the genus of Gentiana. Um, and then I'll launch straight into the bread bow gentian, how it was going before the fire and then it will be going, how, I'll go into how it was going after the fire and how it's doing now. And I'm not sure if anyone knows the outcome of what's happened, but it's a surprise. Um, talk about the conclusions about that and any, any sort of, um, anything that we've really thought about as to, as to why these, this particular outcome has happened and where we're gonna go to from here, any other actions that we'll end up undertaking in the future. So this is me, I'm a flora nerd from way back. That's me eating some Christmas bush. Um, I grew up around here. My folks have got a place at Bumbalong. And so I was lucky enough to grow up in an area where I could um, experience a lot of the local native flora and fauna and really get my teeth into what I was curious and interested in, which were plants. And um, yeah, I've kind of not looked back since that. But um, I, I'm lucky enough to work on over 30 species in New South Wales and my, my responsibilities are species bound. So species don't generally kind of stay just to one little area as according to the you know, Southeast New South Wales um, DPI branch. So that means that I travel from Blue Mountains, up to Wagga, down to Eden. So I have quite a big patch to look after or to drive around looking for, for plants, which poses its challenges, but um, I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, so some of the species that I work on is, that's the um, Astrotrichia species Wallagerau, that's the Marimbula star hair. That was um, one plant that we found thriving in a very heavily hot burnt area down near Eden on the Wallagorau River, so I'm pretty stoked even though I'm covered in soot. And that's Diurus aqualis, which isn't a great photo of it, but um, that's a buttercup double tail orchid. And excitingly, last year we found one at Kawula One. Saving our species, uh, it's $100 million over five years. And those five years wrap up in June this year. So we're not really 100% sure of what it's gonna look like after that, whether it'll roll over into the same thing again, or if it'll be a different machine, who, who really knows? We don't, I'd like to know soon, please. But, um, you know, I'll be patient because I love my job. Um, it's, it's designed to implement critical management actions to prevent species from going extinct in New South Wales. There are nine management streams, so each species is allocated with uh, how it's going to be managed. Uh, for mm -hmm. Gentian in particular, it's site managed, and most of the flora is because they kind of don't move <laughs> well so site managed species and there's also like I mean data deficient which are ones that we just don't really know about that we are going out and searching for and, and keep watch is one that we're like well it's doing pretty okay there's not much we can do we'll just like watch it and keep keep an eye on it and yeah the main aim is to secure threatened species in the wild I'm, I'm a flora person very much so and that's where my kind of all my energy is so I don't have heaps of experience in fauna but translocations with flora um, and fencing, seed collection, um, weed control, pest control, all of those things. So meet the genus Gentiana. So there are 400 species of Gentiana worldwide. Um, most of them are like a really beautiful blue. Some of them, most of them are pale blue actually, but there's also white, there's a couple of yellow and browns and spotties, but there's 400 species, which is a huge diversity. And there's only four in Australia. 
So those are Gentiana boylenii, Gentiana breboensis, Gentiana winger carabiensis, and Gentiana wismanii. All four of them are threatened. Um, they are mostly threatened because they occur in an ecosystem type that is particularly fragile to disturbance and sensitive to impacts. Um, and that is swamp margins and wet seepage depressions uh, amongst grasslands. They're mostly annual um, and they only open in full sun. So there's quite a lot of detectability issues. They're only about this high and they occur amongst grass. And so it's a pretty tricky and they only, they'll only open in full sun. So, you know, if you've even got some cloud in the sky, you better forget about it. And most of them are, are fairly remote and hard to get, get to as well. So the four species are distributed as such over New South Wales. So uh, breadboensis, it's uh, near Durangle, just there. Uh, we've got two locations for Gentiana boylenii, one down here near Quidong, near Delegate, and one in the Auroral Valley. Gentiana winger carabiensis, uh, there's two known sites, but I mean, don't worry about all the, do that's just GPS error. That's just the re records. Um, that's why it looks like there's lots of dots. It's none, pretty much. Um, and Gentiana wismanii, which is a bit disjunct up here around the um, New England Tablelands area, Northern Tablelands. So, I mean, you can see there's not really heaps of diversity, <laughs> and, but they do occur you know, quite, quite a, a long way up and down New South Wales, but that's the only Gentiana records in, in Australia. Um, I can't remember what was on this slide. There we go. Um, it's so, like I said, all, uh, well, this is three of the populations. I don't know heaps about Wismanii. It's a fair way away and it's um, managed by a different SOS team. So I won't be able to talk heaps about it except for what I've kind of known online and from other people. You can see they sort of have in common mostly this, these sort of swampy habitats and they're all, well, exception to that one, that's Winger Caribbe Swamp. That photo was taken probably, well, I mean, it looks like probably the 70s, but more likely the 80s. That's Breadbo Gentian site, pre-fire, and that's Auroral Valley, but that was... <laughs> obviously free fire. I think it was actually 1984, which is when my esteemed colleague John Briggs went out there last and, and saw the plants. That's the Boylenii eyesight, um, Gentiana Boylens gentian, which I'm talking now. So Bowlens, Bowlens, Boylens, I, had to, I looked up how it was pronounced. It's pronounced Boylen, which is going to throw me a lot. So if I pronounce it both ways, I'm sorry. Um, it's listed as endangered under New South Wales legislation and under the EPBC Act, the Commonwealth legislation. There are those two records, one New South Wales record, which is from Quidong in March 1887, um, and it's not been seen since there. So um, they weren't great with GPSs in 1887, so that is all we have for the location, Quidong. Um, so uh, OEH at the time, got Wollongong Uni to do a survey around some of those sites that we thought would be suitable habitat in 2017 and it still was not found. So it was looking pretty bad for the Boylan's gentian. The one site in the ACT is in Aurora Valley, like I said. Um, in 1984, um, it was, there were four plants and it hasn't been seen <laughs> since 1997. I don't know the accurate count for that one. Um, which means it's possibly now, and I don't use the X word very much, <coughs> extinct. Uh, it looks really similar to the breadbow gentian, uh, but it flowers in autumn. And I'm, I mean, I'd like to look at the taxonomy to be really sure that they were different things, but that's, that's just me, doesn't matter. And it, yeah, it grows at similar habitat, wet seepage areas on the edge of natural grasslands in the Aurora Valley. Um, I actually went out to that site on Monday and uh, we still couldn't find it. But um, yeah, we've got Did some... You find no, no. <laughs> I, would have been, I would have been busting out to tell everybody, but no, we didn't find it. Spoiler alert. So that was Monday. That's the Aurora Valley on Monday, and this is kind of the location that it occurs there. And um, 
we did scour it pretty well, but we, uh, yeah, we weren't very successful. There's a lot of grass in here, it's quite thick. Um, they were water bombing Aurora Valley pretty heavily during the fires, so I wouldn't have been surprised if they had um, got, gone through there with some, some water bombing or if the fire just kind of raced around and missed it completely. And this is really cute. This, <laughs> I wanted to look up some um, herbarium specimens for Boylan's gentian and I came across a uh, interpretation or translation of when he submitted the record to F um, Baron Ferdinand von Mueller. Um, it was pretty rare, and this is for the Quidong records as well. Enclosed you will find a little plant with bluish white flowers, which I sent recently, uh, which you requested more specimens. I find this little plant only in one place here, and they're limited to a few square feet. So it was already rare in 1887. He does go on to talk about his diarrhea. <laughs> Super, super cute, <laughs> which, I, which I think is really great for them to, to put online as the specimen information. The taxonomists are great, they're so much fun. Um, yeah, so it was, it was already rare then. So that's a little bit of an interesting, um, an interesting thing. It might not have ever been really, uh, might not have really ever flourished. It might have just always been this single site endemic, which are very prone to extinction, and we know that through a lot of different um, studies. Moving on, uh, Gentiana winger caribiensis, or the winger caribi gentian, is listed as critically endangered under New South Wales legislation and endangered under Commonwealth legislation, which is weird. And the Commonwealth are actually aligning the uh, threatened species lists to reflect when there's something that's only known for one site why, you know, anyway, it'll be, it'll be critically endangered under, oh, well, sorry, yeah, critically endangered under Commonwealth legislation once they align the lists. It's only known from the Windsor Caribbean Swamp, uh, east of Mossvale, and uh, Hanging Rock Swamp, which is near Penrose. Unfortunately, it suffered a huge decline because they um, peat mined that swamp and it collapsed. The ecology completely collapsed and uh, it's no more in that area. There was a little subsection that um, was away from that bit of swamp uh, that there were 300 in and um, that just suddenly declined to 30 and to 12 and then none the following year. And there's no, no real reason that they can see why that's happened um, because they're all so rare because there's just none of them anywhere. Anyway, um, but yeah, that hasn't been seen since yeah, um, probably 1998 or maybe soon after that. So another one that there's bloody none of. <laughs> I sort of realised I'm standing right in the way. Those kind of clasping leaves that are opposite and they're decusset, which means they kind of enclose around the, the stem. That was a swamp. So that's that picture I showed before and that's what it looked like before peat mining. Um, I don't have a picture of after. You'd probably be grateful for that. Um, Gentiana wismanii, the New England gentian. This is the one I don't know heaps about, so I'm, I'll just kind of breeze through this guy. I could only find two, one photo and the sketch. Um, it's vulnerable under New South Wales and Commonwealth legislation, and it's still got a few populations left uh, hanging on in swamps. And um, yeah, it seems to be doing a bit better than the other species in the south. It's a spring flower, sky blue flower. So they're all sort of pale blue, purpley, whitey kind of Flowers. And here's the start of the show, the breadbow gentian. It's critically endangered under both New South Wales and EPBC legislation. It was discovered in 1971, or well, it was recorded in 1971, and uh, it wasn't described until 1996. So it sat on a, you know, in a herbarium until 1996 when they realised that it was separate from Boylan's gentian. Um, I'm not convinced, but that's cool. Um, it's they did a, a, some searches in the area in 1996 in a similar habitat and they couldn't find it because it's only ever been known from this one location on private land south of Durangle near Breadbow. Um, it's a really small area. It's, uh, when I went out there in 2019, it was five, five metres by five metres. It was a similar to um, William Boylan's description of only a few feet. Um, in 1996, there were 50 or 100 plants. Uh, in 71, there were, there were records that there was a couple hundred, like 200 maybe. 
Um, but that declined to 50, about 50 plants in 2012 and then only two plants in 2018. When I first went out there in 2019, there were only about 12 really spindly, weak looking, sad plants that it was, it was looking pretty bad for them. So yeah, they were all pretty imperiled. Um, and actually the Brebbo gentian is on the top 100 imperiled species in Australia, the red hot red list done by, I think, it, I'm not sure if it was, yeah, the Threatened Species Hub did that list. So there it is, it's beautiful little sky blue kind of thing, loving the sunshine, um, occurring amongst grasses and sh sedges and a lot of kind of, well, it's a bit of tea tree there. Yep, still just more photos, beautiful photos. Uh, sphagnum moss is really strongly correlated with it. So if it's spongy underfoot in like a wet area, it's, it's um, you know, look for gentians generally. Um, but these habitats are all really threatened by um, climate change. What was that, sorry? <laughs> um, well, the, not at this site. This site is, yeah, there's, it's not near Breadbow. There's, there's uh, historically, well, actually, I think I'm going into that now. Look at that. <laughs> so historically pigs, um, yeah, pigs and uh, stock at that site, it was, it's private land. So, you know, it's agricultural land. Uh, it experienced land clearing, pasture improvement. Um, but this particular patch of um, drainage line was not touched. It's got a dam at one end and it's got a dam at the other end. And even further down there, um, the, there's been channels dug in to drain the swamp to use it for agricultural land. Uh, currently, <laughs> this may be a bit out of date, the, the low numbers. So um, as you can probably appreciate, having such low numbers as two um, in your entire population is really dangerous to your species continuity. Um, even though they are annual plants, it's, uh, it was getting really, really bad because um, we didn't have any seed in, we had one collection of seed in storage of about 300 seeds, but it was, it was old and we weren't sure, they couldn't germinate it. So there was nothing ex situ and these plants were just disappearing. Um, the competition from native species, so they are, they do like a little bit of space and like native species can shade them out. They won't open up and they won't be pollinated if they don't get the sunshine. So they do like that sort of open, open areas in a swamp is really hard to find. Um, and they, they do suffer from the competition from other native, well, native grasses and um, also tea tree and things that kind of come in around swamps. Exotic grasses have been particularly bad at this location. Um, feral pigs, although now it's, it's a fenced site and we do monitor that. And of course, climate change. So um, these swamps and, and drainage lines that are really uh, still intact are really threatened by the loss of regular rainfall and they can dry out and, and lose their integrity completely. So that was part of the site. That's actually a little bit downstream of where they are. Um, and that's pig damage. Um, so yeah, not, not awesome. So before fire, um, some of the management actions that we, we took for this species is to fence it. So that was a joint project by Bush Heritage and, uh, and us to exclude any, any stock and feral pigs, but there's no stock on the, on the site anymore because it had changed hands. Um, so fencing it off obviously meant that um, new things could come back, including some tea tree. And so we've been working with Landcare to help remove a lot of the top parts of the tea tree to allow some of that space back into this, this area. In 2019, I thought I'd be really brave. I was fairly new. I've been in this role for two and a half years now, but I just started and I was like, I'm gonna check out some seed bags. We have 12 plants, I'm gonna collect some seed. Um, so I put out little, little bags over the tiny little plants in the moss and I didn't actually have heaps of hope for it, but I went out in September and I collected it. And this was groundbreaking at the time. You could just see these little seeds in here and there was about 30 seeds and I was so stoked, 30 seeds. Um, and that was, yeah, pretty much the second collection ever. 
Um, and ongoing is St John's wort. We control within the population, we hand weed it and outside of the fence, the landholder sprays. All right, so in January 2020, the bushfires near Durangal burnt over half of the known habitat. So I'm gonna use my hand here. So the, um, the drainage line, it's hard to tell from a photo because it's 2D. The drainage line kind of goes along here and the dam is down there. And we'd only ever really known them, well, I'd only ever really known them, like, like um, from this sort of area in here. And there was 12 plants existing in here. So the fire came through and burnt to there and then stopped. So when, uh, when the fires were really going off and everyone was panicking and everyone's looking at the maps, the fires near me map, we, we were all looking at it. Um, I was watching that site go under the, the black and it just went under the black. I was like, great, okay, so they're burnt. And we were really worried because they're like a swamp plant. How often do swamps burn like that? Uh, we were really concerned that it would not survive and um, that we had nothing, no seeds and that was just going the same way as the other gentians. It would just be habitat destruction, it's gone. Um, and it burnt really, really hot through there. It was full canopy consumption all the way along there, except it stopped here. It doesn't matter. That whole area didn't burn and those 12 plants remained. So we were pretty stoked with that. Here's one covered in soot. Um, and that's what, the, that's what the habitat looked like all throughout there, these little hummocks of sphagnum moss and small amounts of like, that's a bulbine lily that's been grazed and phragmites and a few of these other little things coming up through there. In May, I went back out to monitor the site and I found all of these little things coming up and I was like, I don't know. There's no photos of gentian seedlings. We don't know anything about them. There's no photos, so I thought, oh, that looks a bit weird, that's a bit big. Could be Plantago. I mean, I mean, it could be Centaurium, it could be a weed, it could be anything, but I am a very optimistic person. <laughs> And I was like, no, they are gentians and there are hundreds of them. But, you know, I was cautious. There were tiny little things, and that's a hand lens. Um, but yeah, I maintained my optimism quietly. Uh, and I marked with some bamboo skewers where these were so that I could come back and find these few little dots. In September 2020, I went back out um, and had a look and the little tiny spots had turned into these uh, kind of uh, rosettes that were growing upwards. They all looked a bit different though, so I wasn't entirely sure still. I was still not 100% convinced. And in November 2020, they were flowering and we counted 279 plants. Wow. So um, yeah, I. I did a, did a happy dance and did a little cry, but um, you know it was very it was very exciting because I mean from 12 plants to 280 in the one year was inc an incredible jump for this critically endangered species. Can I, can I just uh, pull this photograph? There is a trunk that looks like as if it was burned. Oops. Oops. Just, that, yeah. that one at the so, background. Yeah. So that is um, that's the tea tree. And I think there's also hay here in there somewhere. I can't really tell from here. So it's not burned? Or yes, it's all burnt. <laughs> and this is all grown back. Because, because I thought you said uh, this area, this particular area was not burned. Yeah. And the so next, next the discussion would be whether the burning reduces... Um, sure, I will get into that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on it. So this is a map and this is, you know, I've taken out all of the identifying features because it's secret, you guys. The fire, all the burnt area is this patch here that's hashed and the unburnt area is not hashed. So we found 25 flowering plants in that unburnt area that there were 12 in the year before. So that had doubled, so that was great. But where there was none, <laughs> well, maybe in the 80s or 70s, there was 250 and I don't know, this weird one up there might not be right, but there we go. So it's a tiny little, as you can see, it's, it's only maybe 50 meters long and only on this side of the, the drainage line. But it was, it was incredible um, and a lot of hard work. That one plant that I recorded in September, 
ended up turning into this, um, which blew the description out of the water because the, the uh, description in the flora, in the herbarium, um, was uh, small to five centimetres. And this one ended up being 20 centimetres. And yeah, two months later, in this blown up into this beautiful flowering plant with possibly 100 flowers on it. And then in January 2021 this year, um, it was just this seeded, russet, russet, beautiful old plant. I haven't been able to get back out there since, but... Uh, Did you collect seeds? I'm on it. <laughs> I'm on it. It's coming up. <laughs> Due to the incredibly good season, we were able to collect a large amount of seed. So we didn't have to bag it. While I, while I was doing the monitoring, there were already capsules that were open. They looked like that. The seed was going. It was, it was all on. And in total, there were 7,000 seeds that we collected. So this is an envelope full of capsules. Um, being that there were 280 plants and each plant had upwards of maybe 20 flowers on it, that's a, a drop in the ocean of what would have gone back down into the soil. So yeah, very exciting. Um, the yeah, second and the largest collection ever made. We sent those seeds to Plant Bank at Mount Annan at the Royal Botanic Gardens. They have put some into cryo storage for like quite a bit into cryo storage. So they will be sent to the Millennium Seed Bank. They will be not touched. And they've also um, done some germination trials and they germinate really easily, which is really interesting because they couldn't germinate the last collection that was made in 19 or 2013. Was 13. Um, they've already got germination, like I said, and um, yeah, they when they got the seed, they didn't sort of, we, we'd already always had such a hard time germinating it, and we didn't communicate that to them. We just kind of went, oh, here's some seed. And they were like, yeah, cool, we'll germinate it. And like, yeah, good luck. And they were like, oh, we didn't do anything special to it. They just put it out, and away it went. It was really ready to go. Um, so yeah, maybe fresh seed is the answer, but at the same time, it might not be the answer because the seed that came up after the fires would have been 20, 30, 40 years old. Something to think about. So there we are. That's my exciting little discovery. Each of those capsules contained about 250 seeds. So we have so much seed to work with now and that's super exciting. So why, why the sudden boom with all these plants? Why did they come up? Why? Um, you know, why are they so successful now? Uh, was it the fire? It could have been the fire, it burnt everything off. It could have been the smoke and the heat and everything. There could be a germination trigger, but that doesn't make sense because then they just kind of germinated it just straight onto agar or whatever, and it was fine. Very possible that the great follow-up rain in 2020 um, contributed to that. Reliable rainfall we know is really good and associated with those kind of habitats. Or was the removal of overstory and removal of competition also contributing? And the answer to that is it's probably all of those things. <laughs> yes, it worked. Some people got the reference. I wasn't sure if it was, was going to fall then. So um, yeah, it's probably a combination, that's distracting, probably a combination of all of those things. Um, the fire and just those open spaces. And um, it's, it's so fascinating that uh, the, the seed can stay in the soil because, I mean, in a wet environment to have a seed that can stay viable for so long is, is really, um, it doesn't, doesn't make heaps of sense. Why does it not rot? Why does it not dissolve? And maybe the fire helped to do that. I don't know. Lots of germination research is required. And that's something that we now have the seeds to do. Like it's, it's, it's really exciting because we can go, okay, well, we can do some heat treatments here and see if that might be a thing. And if that's the case, maybe the other gentians need a little bit of a burn and maybe if we burn those maybe we can get some seeds and see what they do and it's a lot of really exciting stuff is happening um, yeah obviously they can stay viable in the soil for a really long time um, but fresh seed germinates freely which is really exciting um, and so yeah this this new information has meant that uh, the other sites that there are now none and it really sadly just looked like they were just kind of tumbling into extinction. Perhaps there's hope for those if we treat them, if we burn them. And that 
wasn't really something that we, we would have kind of thought about as being an action that would be beneficial to this, these species that are so sensitive and fragile. If I kind of, I'm not going to go back to the slide, but if you kind of remember when looking at that Aurora Valley site, that was a lot of grass and that was really thick. And going out there on, on Monday with our ACT counterparts, you know, maybe, maybe, there's, maybe there's scope to, to do a patch burn in there if we can get in there. Um, so yeah, there's, there's all of these other options now. And since then, um, the Brebo Gentian's response has inspired, uh, well, it hit the media and people took it and went through it like the Brebo Landcare, it went from Brebo Landcare Bulletin to the Monero Post to ABC Southeast. And it sort of, it grew and grew and grew and people were really excited about it. And that gets me excited about it, but that doesn't take much. But the, um, the network opportunities that have happened through that has meant that I've connected with someone, a researcher from La Trobe University who used to work on the Winter Caribbean gentian and she has seed for Winter Caribbean gentian but she's just like, I just didn't think it would, anything would come of it and so now we're looking at well, maybe, maybe we can sort of do something with this seed and maybe then we can kind of burn this patch here and we're going to form a gentian warrior supergroup, and we're going to we're going to go out. We're going to have badges, and we're going to go out, and we're going to save them. And all of them are going to come back. And I haven't talked to the people with the gentians up north, but you know, I want to go out to that. And anyway, gentian warrior supergroup, which means the possibility of a multi-agency collaboration to research and recover the species, or it's got people really excited. So <laughs> there's still some challenges ahead. 280 plants is not a huge kind of population. It's still really critically endangered. Um, most of that is because we don't really know what's going to happen to it, but we have a lot more information now. Um, there's possibly no seed in storage for the other, uh, for Bowel and Stentium. It looks like there might not be, and if there isn't, then we might have to do a lot of on-ground actions to try to recover some in the wild before we get into doing any, anything ex situ. Um, so yeah, burning some patches might be a way to go. Definitely gonna be doing some additional surveys because of all the attention that it's been getting, been getting a lot of people saying, oh, I think I've got it on my land. I haven't been successful in finding another population, another spoiler alert, but I'm hopeful. So hopefully people with private land, even around that area, but, I mean, it, it might just be one site. And in that case, it's just like, uh, it's very, a very risky site, um, but there's lots of private land to comb through, so I can't be sure. I mean, we saw that like Boylan's Gentian, Aurora Valley to Quidong. I mean, that's a quite a, a long distance, so it's not, it's not likely they've sort of evolved from that one. There's a lot of evolutionary questions there. Um, so yes, again, this particular treatment, burning it with a super hot wildfire on a swamp, which is incredibly difficult to burn in the best of times, um, it might not work for the other species. It might, they might hate fire. We don't, we don't really know, but it looks like if they are really closely related, which it looks like they might be, then um, it's worth a shot. The annual nature of the gentians means that establishing anything ex situ is really tricky. So our management really has to be focused on the sites that they occur in and looking for additional sites. So. Um, because it's there being annual, ha you're having to sort of do lots of generations. And you can plant them, but then you have to make sure that that's a sustaining population. And it's likely that there are other factors that influence germination, including mycorrhizae, which is another factor that I'm not going to throw in today. But that's a, a, an issue that might, might also be there. Um, but I mean, it's possible that we could establish something off site that. Um, could turn over, but it's intensive management and a lot of money. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to leave with this quote. It's one of my favourites. Some people in the audience might have seen it before, not from me. Um, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. It's Margaret Mead. Yeah, you guys have seen it before. Um, <laughs> all gentian sightings to me, please. But um, I think that in conclusion, Private landholders are one of the, the, best, the best sort of sources of this kind of thing and the best people you can talk to about how the, what the land's doing, what's there, what the vegetation's like, and they've got eyes on the ground. Um, might have it at Wondiali.
who knows? So yeah, keep your eyes peeled. Look in the open sunshine, down. Let's see if you can see those little smiling star-shaped faces. That's it. Yeah.